Welcome to the Platform Podcast episode 15. 15. We didn't clap. Oh, we didn't clap. Hang on. Come on. Whoop. Sorry, that's our thing. Um, <laughs> welcome. We are your hosts, Brandon Greco and Johnny B. Bad. Johnny B. Bad. And we are joined by special guests all the way from Melbourne today, Darian Bates. Welcome. Thank you. So first there's, first there's there's ever one of these things, what do we call it? Online. Online. We're this on is, the online. We are. We're on the line for those who get that reference. Wow. No one. <laughs> no. Okay. Corona nobody. Corona 2.0. Coro- yes. yes. This is a Corona PB for the platform. Is this the future for us? Perhaps. What do you mean? Oh, this could be the future for yeah. us. Yeah. Cool. But before we kick off, we do have um, Johnny. Do you want to explain? Ooh, a very important question. It's very tough. This is big. Um, you're only allowed 21 words, and that's it. Oh, you did this with G. Yeah. yeah. I'm no longer allowed to count them. He counts them. Because Johnny can't count. Um, and I it's... think that's most PTs, though. Most coaches and PTs can't count. Yeah, I've been accused of it. <laughs> um, I will argue. But it's... I think we do it so often that we think that we know it. That we oh, 100%. Just get some. We know yeah. what's coming. Yeah, exactly. She gets it. Sometimes clients double count, too. I think I've seen it. I double count a lot. Yeah, you do. Anyways, 21 um, words. <laughs> yeah. Who you are and what you do, all the words count. Doesn't all, matter what you say. He uh, counts them. Thumbs, no pressure. There is a lot of pressure. Well, actually, yeah, there's heaps. All right. So 21 words starting from now. Darian Bates, personal trainer, nutrition coach, uh, eating disorder recovery person. <laughs> that's, 10. that's 10 yep Whoa. that's 12 now damn it every word counts oh i can just keep i can just keep doing that until i get to 21 oh no one else has done that yet that's actually really smart you jacked the system she did jack the system <laughs> fuck we need a new system damn. well done that's a pretty decent <laughs> intro Thank so you are a coach as you said how long you've been coaching for uh for this is my sixth year now oh wow yeah. And but where do you do that? Having, oh, I'm 26. But oh. having said that, like I was, I was a pretty shit coach for like the first three. <laughs> I was your, t- I was your uh. typical good life scum that kind of just went in and thought that she could make $100 an hour from teaching people how to go up and down. I love that. I love <laughs> that she just called it out. Because oh, you're at good life in... Yeah, I'm in Wonturna. So I started off at Fountain Gate, which is in Warren, and then yep. I was there for two years and I moved to Wonturna. Um, yeah. But yeah, I pretty much got into it for that kind of typical reason that, you know, it's a good way to make a lot of money in a little bit of time and didn't realise that <laughs> you have a business to run now. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> and then I, like, I slowly, like, I got more into it, more into it, and that's when I kind of did, like, the mentorship with Jordan Shallow and yep. um, I did one with a guy called Jake Carter. Mm-hmm. And that really kind of excelled me. And then the more that I found that this is a way to help people, the more I got into it. Yeah, hundred percent. Because we met through the prescript level one, um, yeah. and you said you did a mentorship with Jordo before that. Yeah, I did. So I uh, I was working at Pro World Gym in Doncaster, yep. and he came in after being at the Arnold's, and um, I just thought he was like this big bearded dragon who. You know, just do a lot of weights, and then um, I didn't know who he was. The dragon. That's the <laughs> and best then, oh. then um, Emad told me who he was, and I started following him on Instagram, and um, like he was literally the smartest person I've ever heard speak. So then I contacted him and I said, "Hey, um, I'm shit at all this. Can you teach me some stuff?" And then yeah, and then after that, I went to like every seminar that he did down here. Went to the one in Sydney, and then did the prescript level one. Yeah, absolutely. He's actually probably one of the smartest people you'll ever, ever actually speak to. He's probably, on another yeah. level. It, almost like, I remember I first met him in 20, shit, what year are we? 2020? 2016? 2017. 2017. And like back then, he was he would talk at this level. You're like, what the fuck did you just say? I feel like he's really learned to be able to communicate 
to people at normal that people. high normal people <laughs> at that high level though so that's really cool um well, he said it even like when he was presenting so like before he started presenting a lot he did like acting read up on acting and like how to perceive, oh, wow. per, uh, perceive a message so that more people could get engaged and understand it and he does it in a way that he doesn't necessarily want you to understand it because he wants mm. you to go and learn those concepts and then make your yep. own thing out of it absolutely i think that's the biggest takeaway is that from the pre-script i took was not necessarily the content but the the critical thinking aspect learning to understand these uh, these whatever he was talking about and apply it to your own situation to your own like niche within the industry it was really really yeah. cool yes yeah, awesome so you've been coaching for six years now you also touched on your eating disorder now i've listened to a few podcasts obviously where you've spoken about it before when did the eating disorder start for you? Give us a bit of a rundown on that. So when I was like 12 or 13, I was diagnosed, they called it chronic fatigue, but now that I know more about <clears throat> chronic fatigue, it was more like adrenal fatigue. Um, yep. And I got very weak, like I couldn't lift my hands up above my head, I couldn't wash myself in the shower, my mum had to do all that stuff. So wow. I ended up going into hospital and it was just, yeah, it was adrenal fatigue. Like I was just mentally and physically stressed. And then um, when I got into hospital, I started just getting better. But obviously with that and the lack of movement, I gained quite a bit of weight. Mm -hmm. Nothing that I was never overweight. Um, I just was, I got very uncomfortable because it happened very suddenly. My boobs grew, I got stretch marks um, and things like that. And so then when I got out, I started dieting and exercising. And yep. from there, it kind of, progressed and new rules came into place new habits um and new like fixed beliefs that weren't that weren't true and were uncontrollable um didn't make any sense but they kept progressing and then it was something that i had to do day in day out so like one of the things was i had to set my timer and i had to exercise for four hours a day it didn't matter uh -huh. what it was because i didn't know much about exercise then but it just had to be four hours of whether that was jumping on trampoline trampoline going for a bicycle ride doing uh, i had this uh boost it's called uh boost metabolism burn fat by jillian michaels oh. and i used to do that like three times a day in my bedroom uh, a lot of burpees sidekicks things like that and um it progressed and progressed and then when i was 15 i was diagnosed oh wow so you're doing all this from the you know age of 13 really yeah yeah it's very young jeez that's Damn. that is Jillian Michaels, by the way, fuck. <laughs> Bloody hell, she needs to stop. What a Is she still out? Yeah. Um, yeah, she's still right. She was doing a squat demo the other day on Instagram, and I was just looking. I was like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, fuck. There's a lot of people in that industry that needs to stop. Um, yeah. But yeah, fuck, from age 12 to 15, you're, like, you're doing all this inside your workout when most you know young girls that age are going out with their friends and all that stuff. Were you still doing that stuff, or were you just like kind of recluding back and kind of staying in your room and doing those those workouts for four hours a day uh before 13 i had a a small group of friends i was never one to have like a big group but there was i had like one best friend that we did everything with and then she changed school so that was kind of a contributor to it too yep. um but the more that i did it and then i started going out with friends the more my friends would pick up on habits and they would make comments out of concern but they yep. would ask me if i was okay so then I secluded myself from those social mm -hmm. events because I didn't want people picking up on these habits. Um, and yep. then that kind of made it worse because now no one is picking up on them. There's more areas to hide all the habits. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes more of a fear that, you know, you're being exposed and then you want to recluse more. <laughs> yeah, my mum was very depressed at the time. So she didn't, you know, she was in her bedroom all day and or in the lounge room doing her own thing and in yep. her own kind of little bubble. My dad was at work all day, so it, was, it became very easy to sort of sneak it in. Were you still going to school at the time? I was. Um, when I got to year 11, I was up to my second admission into hospital, um, the second or third. And then the, uh, after year 11, we kind of said, look, let's not even attempt year 12. Um, I still got like high grades in year 11. I did really well. I did it all when I was in hospital, but my mum just sort of made the call that I didn't need that for year 12. So yep. I took that year off. Um, it just happened that that year, my mum and dad split. They went their own ways. That caused another cascade of dramas. My dad broke his back. Um, 
So it ended up getting worse by taking a year off than maybe it probably would have been a good distraction at the time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, you mentioned that was your second hospital admission. So how many, yeah. What at what point did your, was it your mum that took you in, I think? Yeah, so uh, what happened was when mum started getting concerned and seeing the weight dropping off and all these um, negative things happening, like, you know, my hair was falling out. Um, my skin was tearing all the time. Like, mm -hmm. I, I remember opening a pack of, um, like, those teddy bear plastic packets for my oh, the, cousin. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh. And yep, I know the, the cookies, the little cookies, yeah. Yep. And I, know. I um, the, the tiny teddies. Tiny teddies. Yeah, teddies. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and opening that packet, um, I got a, a big cut down my skin because my skin was just that fragile that opening, like, Shit. a plastic packet. Tore it. So those kind of things were, like, the red flags. And... Mum kept taking me into my doctor. My doctor was really good at the time, and he kept saying she needs to go to emergency. Take to emergency. Yeah. I went to emergency maybe four or five times, and every time I got sent home with a, a piece of paper that said, here's a meal plan. Um, oh. no, yeah, wasn't going to follow it, wasn't going to do any of it. Um, and then one time, the last time that I went into emergency and got sent home, they told my mum that I wasn't sick enough to go in yet. Um, that night, my mom took me back and I had to go into ICU. So my heart rate was, I was 165 centimetres tall and I was weighing 28 kilos. Wow. Um, my heart, yeah, my heart rate was at 28 beats per minute. So I went into ICU. They told her that I might not make it the night. Um, and she was obviously very frustrated because she was like, she was here four hours ago and you sent her home. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. And, and not to mention that we told them that, you know, I was getting up in the morning and I was passing out and things like that. But um, I got very smart at tricking the system too because it's like it's one blood pressure reading that they do. And yep. we both know that there's things that you can do before you get your blood pressure taken that will elevate it. Um, yep. You know, getting up, dancing around, taking maybe like a caffeine drink or something like that will elevate it. Um, if you're more hydrated, that will increase the blood pressure too. So I'd drink a lot of water. Um Anyway, then uh, I was in ICU for two weeks, then coronary care for two months, then the eating disorder ward for two months. Then I went out. When you go out, you go into what they call the outpatient unit. So mm -hmm. you go in twice a week, and then once you're stable, you go in once a week. Once you're more stable, you go fortnightly, and then progressively like sort of lengthen those distances out. I didn't get past the twice a week stage before I went out and my, my um, weight went back down. So because they restore the weight so quickly, your body doesn't have time to adapt that once you get out, you lose it all rather quickly too, especially once yep. you get rid of all the bloating and things that you experience while you're in hospital. So went back in um, and this time I was in the adult ward because I had just turned 18. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went into adult ward twice and then when I got out of that, I went into what they call the butterfly day program, which is really good uh, program. I'm not sure if they have it anywhere else, but they have it in Victoria. And yep. they, you go from school hours. So you go, instead of going to school, you go Monday to Friday there and you do things like meditation, journaling, uh, you eat all at the table together. Um, the doctor comes and visits you there. I was there for maybe six months um, and then I lost uh, the weight again. Oh, actually, I kind of, I got out of there actually. My, I convinced my parents that I was well enough to get out and then I ended up losing weight again and I went back to the adult ward. Were you, were you well enough to get out or were you just trying to convince your parents that you didn't need to go? Through this process, were you, uh, I guess, accepting of the diagnosis or were you like, nah, I, I'm still kind of denying it? Uh, I accepted it, but very fearful of it. So yep. um, they don't educate you much while you're in any of these systems on mm -hmm. how your body works or why you need to restore weight and how the weight gets stored or what happens to your body. So it just becomes a big fear of like, shit, like I'm, I'm going to get fat. And yep. then, uh, so I noticed that I was gaining weight in places that I didn't want to. Like I could no longer feel my hip bones, which is like a marker for me that I was still skinny enough. Um, so then I ended up going, uh, yeah, so I ended up talking to my parents and still letting me out. And then I went back into the ward again. Um, I, I, the stays were short at this time um, and there wasn't so strict because you're an adult. The trouble is that once you and my mom was very fearful of this but once you turn 18 you have you decide what treatment you get so unless yeah. you're at, at risk of harming yourself mm. you decide what happens oh wow so it must have been that would have taken a toll on your mom as well obviously you mentioned before yeah. she was going through her own battles and depression at the time 
Yeah. So she ended up leaving my dad um, when I said, like, when I was 18, and she um, moved out, and I stayed with my dad. But that was because I knew my dad wasn't as experienced with picking up the signals and the markers and knowing all the behaviors that I did. So I stayed with him as a way to sort of get away with it for longer. And then I made the decision um, later to move in with my mum. And from there, things started to get better. What age was that? Uh, this would have been around about 20. So you make, uh, like when I say things got better, my mum became very real with the idea that things aren't going to get better no matter what kind of interventions we have until I say that I want to get better. Absolutely. So we can sort of like keep you safe and as much as we can, but it's not going to get better until the sufferer decides that, hey, I'm over this, I'm done, I want to live my life. And kind now, of takes us to what was that moment for you? Like, at what point? Because, you know, this from age 12 to you now, what, 20 back then? Yeah. That's what, eight years. At what point did you go, fuck, that's it, enough's enough? So, I, um, it was really funny because I was actually, I had a rule with my mum. My mum said I wasn't allowed to exercise if I lost any weight, and I did. So then she said, mm-hmm. okay, no more exercising, like, I'm cutting it off. She had, like, a little camera outside, and she caught me going for a run one day. <laughs> and then she, um, yeah, and I hear as I saying I didn't do it, and then she pulls up the camera, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it got banned from that, and then I snuck out one night, and I did a boxing class, and I loved it. Um, I had so much fun, and it was sort of the first time where I really felt like daring again. Like, I didn't feel mm-hmm. like I had this eating disorder identity, and no one there knew that I had an – I looked like it, but no one actually knew that I had an eating disorder. So um, it was almost like a fresh start in a way. And the trainer came up to me and he said, like, you've got actually some pretty good potential. If you want to do this, I need you to gain some weight so that I can chuck you in the ring. Um, So from there, yeah, I started gaining weight really slowly. And I just kept sneaking out with, like, books in my hand telling mum that I was going to the library. And then I would get changed to my gym gear, get changed out, come home, grab my books, walk inside. Um, And then one day I come home with a big fat nose and she... (laughs) What's going on? <laughs> what made you choose to get into boxing? Was that just something else you'd come across and thought you could try or? Yeah, so purely in that moment, it was like, I know that boxing is great for losing weight and I know that yeah. it burns a lot of calories. And so then I just looked for the closest boxing class. I had to try and find one that wasn't at like a commercial gym because I had been to commercial gyms before and then they would give my mum a call and say that she's oh, wow. out. Yeah, so I ended up... Um, going to one that was uh, it was called sting gym and danny nong and costa the trainer there he yeah he really helped me because he didn't put that stigma on me having an eating disorder that's awesome though like you know it does take uh, one person to go okay cool you can do this if you know that person really impacted you obviously is that what started your career in pt like from there yeah so i got um really heavily into boxing bounced around a few trainers and then started competing in amateurs Ooh, um, oh cool yeah, and then it actually happened that I was studying uh, advanced my advanced nutrition at the, my advanced primary nutrition medicine at the time, and my dad, uh, my that's when my dad sort of broke his back. So he sort of said, "You need to start looking at another job because I can't support you anymore." Yeah. Um, and then that's when I thought, "Oh yeah, like PT, you earn heaps of money." <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, except in that first six to twelve months where you're trying to do it a client base, <laughs> they don't yeah, tell you and that. Then, yeah, and at the same time, yeah, they always say, um, oh, summer's coming up, it's a great time to get clients, and oh, winter's mm. coming, so then by the time you finish your course, it'll be a great time to get clients. And it's like, yeah, it's like, no, always no. a great time to get clients. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is always a great <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So from um, the, sorry, you go. Yeah, so then when I went to do the course, um, you can imagine having uh, only boxing trainers as my coaches. Yeah. It was a lot of... Um, shit training i guess that's the only way you can put it it's like it's dumbbell curls and like all day long oh, <laughs> oh wow punching with i mean that's not too bad like dumbbell curls all day curls long. are an I, integral part of a training yeah session. i feel like yeah. the biceps are the most important uh, muscle muscle thank you <laughs> you can tell we're good coaches <laughs> the biceps are the most important muscle in the body for sure yeah, yeah. absolutely so from you started boxing you got your pt shirt at this time were you still battling these ed i guess um uh, issues or were you kind of getting getting over it at this stage i had a period for maybe a year where i was doing quite well and i would say that i had more orthorexia which isn't really diagnosed that often because it's so hard to do but orthorexia is an uh, obsession with eating healthy foods 
where you yeah. kind of have a big fear of going off that and eating something that you would deem as unhealthy. Um, so I was very controlling. I weighed everything to the gram and all that stuff. And then um, it got a bit overwhelmed. Like uh, there was a, peri- a period where I started losing clients and I felt like I didn't have any control over what was going on. Um, and it actually transitioned into going from anorexia to having this sort of orthorexia to then going into binge eating um, and bulimia. So a lot of um, obsessive eating um, until I felt sick and then purging. Um, and that I still suffer to today. So yeah. that's something that was really hard to talk about at the start because when I had the anorexia, I felt like I'm in control. I know what I'm doing. Like, hmm. even though I wasn't in the eating disorder, was in control, I kind of had this persona that I can control my weight and my behaviors and whatnot. And then when it got to binge eating and bulimia, like, I just felt like I wasn't in control. Like, I eat till I feel like I need to throw up and I can't breathe because like you know my stomach's pushing against my lungs and then I'll go and purge until it's empty and then I'll do the process again and it would fill out my whole day and it was just like this big dopamine hit that I got when I was eating Mm -hmm. and it shut up everything else and um I think that sort of like the the hardest the hardest thing to kind of accept that that's where you're at at that moment absolutely and you mentioned you're still battling these things today yeah, so I'm I'm much more aware of it, and like I, every time, I, even like when I go to see a counselor or a psychologist, like you're very aware of your emotions and feelings. So I was like, yeah, well, I've been suffering from it since I was 13. So <laughs> yeah, you've had <laughs> 13 you know years to yeah <laughs> to, to practice and understand what you're going through. Yeah, that's why cool. am I paying you? Should we sue trolls? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like I'll just save the money and coach you through this. Yeah, <laughs> but I like what you're doing now because you have. You know, obviously, you're in the space of educating people. You've upskilled yourself quite a lot, and you've actually just started um, educating other females. Or you're, I guess, big in the space of educating females on the right way to do things. Yeah, I think it, it came to this idea that if I had have known the things that I know now about eating disorders, I'm not mm-hmm. saying I wouldn't have gotten it, but I would be more equipped with the knowledge to understand the behaviors and the triggers and what happens to my body when I do these things to maybe not let it go so far. Absolutely, because it affects a lot more people than we recognize. Yeah, yeah well, um, it's actually got the highest death rate out of any other mental illness, but yet yeah. there's only 37 beds in Australia allocated to eating disorders. Shit, Jesus. Because you, cause you're, you've created a program, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so I did a women's empowerment program, which wasn't aimed at eating disorders, but it was yeah, aimed yeah. at like educating women on all aspects. So whether that be like their menstrual cycles, um, depression, anxiety, uh, trauma, uh, we go over like the pros and cons of fad diet. So like talking about not that vegan's a fad diet, but talking about vegan. And if you do choose to do these, these are the things that you need to look out for. Absolutely. Um, we talk about like keto diet as well. And again, if you choose to do this, these are the things that you need to be aware of. Um, Jordan jumps on in, he talks about like female training and sort of the different anatomies to look out for and how to train around those or what kind of exercise selection you should use. Um, Yeah, so it's very good. And then looking at even stuff like contraception and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, what to look out for if you are getting the side effects of that because I think a lot of people go on those kind of things when they're quite young and then they don't know what to look out for. 100% because I don't think many people are aware of the signs in those early stages as, as you said yourself it's like you may not have been able to prevent it but if if you had the correct tools you could have um, managed it at least a little bit better yeah and I think like social media gets a really big bad rap for uh, having a big play in eating disorders or a big role in the um, onset of them but I really don't think they do like I don't think social media is really to blame as much as what people think I think it can be quite an educational platform for people and I think it's just about you being smarter about who you follow and how you engage in it Mm -hmm. um but yeah I think that we're looking at the wrong with the wrong players here like I think that looking at sort of more you know the mental health side of things and whether that does have something to do with the use of social media but then maybe look at like is the person getting outside enough are they having socially healthy relationships um do they have a the just the things like do they have a healthy diet because like we know things like if we don't have enough omega-3s in our system then that's going to play with our neurotransmitter health and it's going to play with our brain health like 60 percent of the dry weight of the brain is from fat yeah. Um, and then looking at vitamin D, if we're low in vitamin D, then we're not going to get those neurotransmitters firing properly or the um, synactive cleft of them 
is, isn't going to process so quickly and actually serotonin isn't going to pass over very well. Um, looking at things like, you know, your B12 and things like that. So like if we're deficient in those, mm. which a lot of people with eating disorders are because they're not eating enough nutrients, then by not addressing those, we're not really getting to what could be causing the, psychi- the psychiatric part of the eating yep. disorder. When you work with clients at the moment, do you find a lot of women are coming to you and you can kind of pick up these signs straight away or are you more aware of what other people are doing? I'm more aware of it. So like I've got a cousin at the moment who uh, we now that as a family, we're more aware of it. We believe that she's going through it, but it's very hard to address that. When someone's not in the realm of knowing that they've got it or accepting that they've got it it becomes quite defensive so people talk about like early intervention and things like that and it's, it's very hard to do because if someone doesn't know that they've got it yet they're just going to get defensive like it's like if, if you didn't know that you were depressed but someone came up to you and said hey dude like i think you're suffering with depression you just get on the back end and sort of you know arc up and defend yourself because you don't see that you've got depression absolutely so what are you doing for those like for the people like your cousin what what can you do to support them i think it's just letting them know that they are uh, approaching it in a safe environment first so making sure that people feel that they're not getting bombarded or accused of anything but Mm -hmm. creating a safe environment and just telling them like i wouldn't say the words you either like i'd say i can see this happening and i just want to know that you're okay um and then letting them know that when to them when they are ready to turn that page and go, I, I need to reach out for someone, you're the first person that they come to. Yep. Who was that person for you? <clears throat> um, I think it, it would have been my mum. Like if I had to say anyone, it is my mum. But at the same time, the amount of times I told my mum, I hated her throughout the process. <laughs> I'm surprised she's still young. <laughs> Poor mum. Uh, your mum loves you. It's okay. Yeah. I'm sure she understands it wasn't yourself. It was more the, the eating disorder doing the talking at that stage. 100%. Yeah. That's so sick though. Like I'm really impressed by how you've come through this and still like you're very open about how you're still battling these things but helping other people and inspiring other people. Like I know through your social media you're getting a lot of a lot of traction and a lot of people, a lot of females actually as well, um, look into your program and the Women of Empowerment program is fucking, sounds amazing. Like that's fucking sick. Yeah, it's really good. Um, there was one question I did just forget. What's up? Well, I don't know why I'm looking at you. I just completely <laughs> forgot it. Off topic a little bit. I also want to know about your boxing. How many fights have you had? <laughs> um, so I had a few, but when I talk about it, I'm very, I'm a very small person uh, as far as weight goes. So I was boxing girls that were like 12 or 13. Oh. So to brag about it, it's a bit like, uh, you punched a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Look, but did you win? <laughs> I, I won some. I lost some though because I have a, um, I'm making excuses for my losers. Um, I, I, um, I have a really bad blood nose. I've had it cauterized twice, but it still just, it bleeds like a tap and um there was one time when i had a hematoma in my eye because my nose had bled that bad that because i had it cauterized it fucked up and it caused a hematoma in my eye and i was in a boxing match and um someone hit me in the eye and then it all came get gang <laughs> down my nose so i lost that one in like 10 seconds because the first hit just made my nose bleed. damn that's pretty badass though like i'm not gonna lie i've never <laughs> no, been in a yeah, boxing I'll- ring no matter what and also, like some kids I meet, I'd love to punch kids sometimes. They're shitheads. Yeah. So you're probably living yeah. in the dream. <laughs> Absolutely. I still forgot my question. It was fucking <laughs> sick too. I'm so pissed off about that. And what's your um, coaching like at the moment these days? You're doing a bit of strength training with your clients at Good Life and stuff like that? Or what do you find yourself doing in that sort of realm? I do do more strength training. Um, yeah. I used to be sort of like the more cardio-based stuff just because that's yeah. what I was indulged in at the time but then like yeah as i said like i got more educated with jordan than that i definitely took more the strength training realm yep um yeah the um i I guess i I do try to transition more into the nutrition though because that's what my passion is just purely because of my experience yeah and working with sort of people in similar situations with the eating disorders um is there a a good way you can help them transition into doing some training in a, a positive way that you can help them with yeah, so I think it's about not like uh, some people when they're 
not training, they will look at like restricting their calories. And I think that's like just a negative connotation to have. Or if you're eating a certain amount of calories, then you've got to sort of like quote unquote train to burn it off. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like getting over that kind of uh, hurdle is the first step, like making sure that they don't correlate training with burning calories and they yeah. correlate training to feeling good and getting stronger and, um, you know, getting all these endorphins released and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I also think like as far as when you asked if I deal with anyone with eating disorders, not necessarily, but a lot of people suffer with binge eating. Yeah. And, you know, like they, they find something that they have a food addiction and then they will, when in the right environment or the right stimuli, so whether that be stress or not, not whatnot, they will um, indulge in binge eating. So it's more coming up with tactics around that that I deal with a lot. So mm. one thing I'll get my clients to do is if they feel like a binge is coming on, set the timer for 20 minutes, have a glass of water. After that 20 minutes, if you still want to binge, go for it. But, if I, but most of the time, after 20 minutes of thinking about it and finding something else to do, they don't want to do it anymore. Um, yeah, so that's one tactic that I use. The other one is uh, I, with eating disorders in particular, which I say I don't come across a lot, but when I do, I get them to get a started journal. They split the page in half. On one side, they write what the eating disorder is telling them, and on the other side, they write like what the rationale is. Um, so then like they have that physical evidence there that the thoughts that they're having are really irrational and aren't true. Um, so whether like the eating disorder says like you're going to gain a bunch of weight, you're going to get a stomach, like one – one salad never made anyone skinny. One burger is not going to make anyone fat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a fucking really good tactic, though. I like that. And, I mean, you could apply that to a lot of mental health situations, not just eating disorders. But, fuck, that would actually be very helpful for people mm -hmm. just to see how irrational their thinking is. And I think progress them quicker to probably admitting that, okay, maybe I do have a bit of a problem here that I need to get addressed. Reach out for help after that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. what's in store and next for you? Um, I'm, well, I'm not sure. I'm trying to go more online with the nutrition stuff, um, especially now that we're in lockdown. Like, I think it's a smart decision to make in case yeah. this happens again. Um, Absolutely. But, like, my goal is really to sort of just make all of this information more accessible for people. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got an eating disorder ebook coming out, which will um, go over sort of all the things that I think the healthcare system isn't doing that they could be doing. So mm -hmm. looking at like sort of those malnutrients and looking at things like um, incorporating like more journaling, meditation, um, and things like that. But it more goes into the science-based stuff of the malnutrients. Um, yeah, I think that's sort of where the brain where you're is heading. Down. Yeah. Especially with this lockdown, as you said, like going back to what you said before, actually, it's like the need to not drop calories, like when you're not training. The amount of people ready during this lockdown period that have dropped their calories because they've obviously all gyms are closed and we're limited access to what we can do. It's astonishing. It's just like, just eat normally. Like what's, yeah. why, why do we need to drop calories? Like yeah. if you're not, would you drop calories on days you don't train? It's just insane. I feel like yeah. coming out of this, there's going to be a few people going fuck with, with a bit of eating issues. Yeah. It wouldn't yeah, help anyone too, who's on like the edge. I think too, looking at the, the stress level of everyone too, like dropping your calories isn't necessarily going to be a good thing if your stress level is already elevated. 100%. Um, 100%. And then too, like one thing that I was thinking about with this is uh, even myself, like I have a lot of certain food that I like to eat and I don't want to eat anything else. And I can mm. imagine people with eating disorders going to the shops at the moment and half the stuff that they want is gone. It's not um, even there. That can cause a cascade of things. So that's What you're eating like now scary. though? Are you... Would you say you're still in that healthy eating or are you just like, are you more open to other foods or? Uh, no, so I'm, I'm still very fearful of certain foods. Um, mm -hmm. if I, I am sort of at a stage now where if I track it and it fits into my macros, then I'm okay with eating it. Like it's nothing that I would do, but like once a week, if I go out for dinner and that, as long as it's tracked, then I'm okay. If it's not tracked, not okay, binge and purge. Yeah, absolutely. I get that. Now, because you've, you go out to dinner once a week and you're married to your husband? I'm married, yeah. <laughs> to my husband. Married, married to your husband, husband, obviously. Good pick up. I know. <clears throat> hey, well, it's it's 2020. You can't assume anything, mate. Like, That's very true. Exactly. So that was a correct statement. It's also super early up here. Time difference. Oh, they're in the future. They're in the future. She's an hour <laughs> ahead of us. Weird world. 
I know if we waited three more days to do this, it would we would have been synced up with normal times. By the way, I think, oh really? Yeah, oh, daylight. Oh yeah, daylight savings ends in like two days. Finally, back to normal. Whoa, that's their normal. <laughs> Are they can we behind? just can we touch on time zones though? Like, wouldn't it be easier if everyone was just on the same time? Yeah, regardless awesome. of whether or not you go to bed at you know five a.m. in the morning, that's yeah. the fucking time that you go to bed. But at yes. least then we don't have this crossover with the time zones and no. organising things. You can't get a magic amount of extra sunlight because you change the time. No. I, I hear you. It's crazy. <laughs> like, I, because even talking, you know, we're podcasting with uh, Gwen again after this, and it's like, fuck. He's like, let's do it at 10 a.m. I'm like, who's 10 a.m.? Yeah, who's 10 a.m.? Is that my 10 a.m.? Your 10 a.m.? <laughs> it's so confusing. What's worse was Adelaide, just like on this time zone thing, because I have an online client in Adelaide. And before daylight savings, we were in front of them. But now with daylight savings, she's half an hour ahead. And I'm like, the fuck? How did that happen? That's weird. I know. I don't do that. And there's a point where America goes on daylight savings, but theirs is only for like a really short amount of time. Really? Yeah, I don't know where it is, but they go, they have a daylight savings period. Um, Because I was doing coaching with someone up there and we had like a group coaching call. Yep. And then, I, like, it, by the time I adjusted to that daylight savings, it turned back. So then I missed <laughs> it again. That's ridiculous. I vote with Darian on that everyone should be on the time zone, same time zone. Our time zone. Preferably our time zone. <laughs> our time zone. So we don't have to adjust, like... Yeah, I think that's yeah. fair. That is very fair. Yeah, yeah we'll write um, a letter. <laughs> yeah. Who, who do I write a letter to? Just go write one. <laughs> Just write one, it'll yeah. work. It'll work. <laughs> All right, so... Before before we finish up, I wanna we do end with some very important questions, but mm. I wanna ask you where can people find you? Where can people um, if they are looking for more information on firstly eating disorders or maybe they're aware of their starting to get develop some habits, where's the best place to start? Um, so on Instagram it's at Coach Darian and Bates. Um, yep. I've got a website, uh, www.dazz's, so that's D A Z S P T. Dot com. It's the most Australian um, thing I've ever heard, Dazza. <laughs> yeah, but uh, trying to I get people it. to pronounce Darian, like, it's the worst thing in the world. I had really? someone ask me, that, yeah, because my, my mum and dad, like, they all just called me Dull. Like, because I, I didn't even think they wanted to say Darian. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then people would be like, how do you, is it Darian or Darian? And I was like, I actually don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was like just call me Daz Dazza yeah so, the and then yeah, yeah, working in a commercial gym it was easier than getting my name mixed up all the time yeah 100% alright so yeah. we'll put all those details definitely in the show notes um, with a link to your obviously website and Instagram is there any other place you want us to give a shout out uh, I don't think so like I got Twitter and that but I wouldn't even tell you what it is yeah sweet oh drop it in the show notes i'll find you on twitter <laughs> all right so before we finish up these are 10 is it 10 eight plus two that's right because i threw in the two yep. this is the this is the thing we can't it's count two bonus questions he's like i've created 10 new questions and it turned out it was eight it took us two episodes <laughs> to work out it was eight it really did <laughs> so well, so i've thrown in the other yeah two ones. questions are you ready all right they're yeah. rapid fire got to answer first away. thing comes to your head yeah favorite book uh, why we sleep. Okay. Ooh, oh, nice. Nice. Hey, uh, wait, so real quick. Sorry, I know this is a rapid fire, but why we sleep? Is that the, whose author is that? Uh, don't make me butcher his name, but he just talks about the science behind sleeping and it's super interesting. I like the way that he does it too because like when you start off the book, he says like, he'll tell you what the chapters are about and you can yeah. skip to whatever chapter you feel like you want to read up on and it will still make perfect sense. So like you can skip chapters and then go back to chapters. Fuck, I need that book. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. If you're in a plane crash, no, you're in a plane crash and it <laughs> crashes and you have to live on an island, only one person, who's you going to be? Can you say my dog? Yeah. Yeah. Fuck Anyone it. you want. Which leads yeah, perfectly into the next question. Yeah. Um, and probably maybe answers it. Dog or cat? Dog. Yeah. Well 100% played. fuck cats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what superpower would you like to have? Fly. Yes. What type of apple are you? Pink lady. Yeah. It's the first quick answer we've ever gotten. I know. Everyone freaks out. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what apple. I had one choices. client say he's an orange. <laughs> <laughs> is the tooth fairy real? 
No. Oh, oof, damn it. Uh, what's your secret talent? Um, I know all the words to Baby Got Back. Wow. That's dope. Can we get a, like a, a quick bit of it? Yeah, please. We have a well, our video guy is also a beatbox specialist. So if you could give us a little bit of that, he'll just beatbox over it. I'm sure. I just start from very start. Just start wherever. Just this let is it sick. Hit. Drop it. I like big butts and I cannot lie. <laughs> Other brothers can't deny. Wanna go walks in with the inner beauty waist and a red thing in your face, you get sprung. Wanna pull up the top, cause you know that butt will stop. The inner beauty she's wearing. I'm hooked, I can't stop staring. Oh baby, I wanna get with ya and take your picture. My homeboy tried to warn me that that thing you got is ooh, so fun. That's amazing. There's no beatboxing. <laughs> oh, he'll beatbox for sure. We'll get that audio in over. Can you do that? Yeah. No, can he you can do, do that? He can do anything. Ooh. No, well, he'll do it. He's just the beatboxer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry. That was really cool. Um, what's one thing you could do right now to make you famous that no one knows about? Seeing Baby Got Back. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair. Now, who would win in a fight, <clears throat> Superman or Batman? Batman. Oh, finally oh, someone answers correctly. Are you sure? Yes. Have you seen the body on Batman? Have you yeah, seen Superman's right. laser eyes? Yeah. No. I'm, I'm, <laughs> that, that training montage of Ben Affleck in mm. Batman Got Superman, like, I'm with you there. Fuck. Have you seen, um, have you gone back to the old Batman and, like, how his dad bod has turned, slowly just turned into, like, this old Dwayne Christian. Johnson? Uh, <laughs> Dwayne yeah. Johnson. <laughs> yeah. Fuck yeah. Um, and last question. Now, you've only, like, really gotten to know each other in this last hour. But most important question, who's the best, Johnny or myself? <laughs> it's clearly Easy. Johnny. It's Easy, Brandon. Wow. It's clearly Johnny. Yeah. I don't want to answer. The shirt. You got to answer. It's, it's just rapid fire. <laughs> Whatever comes to you first. If you say Johnny, I'll applaud It's okay you. to be honest and say it's Brandon. We, we all know he's the best. We argue about this all the time. Bronny? Oh, she hacked the system again. Damn it. <laughs> You're not coming back on the podcast <laughs> purely because you've ruined all our systems. No, uh, that was awesome. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Obviously, it's quite early in both states. And can we do a virtual we, clap? We can do a virtual clap yeah, at the end to yeah. finish up. But Excellent. we really appreciate your time, your information, obviously sharing your journey. I think there's a lot of people that could listen to this and get a lot out of it. Um, so we'll put everything in the show notes. And thank you so much again. No, thank you. It's, it's great to sort of bring light into these things that don't get talked about very much. Absolutely. All right, so we finish with a clap. Um, I don't know how we'll do it. And three, two, one, go. That was, I think we think that worked. (laughs) We'll just do it. Yes. (laughs) 